Okay, um, so for folks watching the FreeBSD Developer Summit, welcome back from our last break of the day. Um, I'm here with Jordan Hubbard, who is, I hope I say this accurately, one of the founders of the FreeBSD project. Um, just here to chat about kind of some of the early history and things that went on in FreeBSD that many of us may not be as familiar with um, and kind of go from there. So Jordan, maybe if you wanna start by introducing yourself um, and talking about maybe how you came to be involved with FreeBSD and kind of how you got started working with BSD in the first place? Sure. So yes, I am Jordan Hubbard and I am one of the three original founders of the FreeBSD project. Uh, Rod Grimes and Nate Williams were the other two. Um, but of course, if you really wanna, I think be truly accurate, you have to include the 386 BSD founders as well. Uh, so uh, uh, folks like Terry and um, uh, Bill and many other patch kit maintainers. Um, so that's actually kind of, I think, a good a good segue to to how it all started. So it's you know picture it's uh, late '80s, and you have BSD as a well established operating system running on Vaxes, uh, running at the core of uh, SunOS, which was uh, what predated Solaris, which was essentially a kind of a rewrite based on System Five. Um, but Solaris was really was really popular in its day, and that was essentially a straight up uh, BSD port to uh, to multiple architectures. As Sun was evolving as a company, you had Altrix, which was BSD for DEC or Digital Equipment Corporation. Uh, you have my cat stepping on my mask. Step away. Go on. Uh, and so um, BSD was actually robust and commercial grade and present in, uh, in quite a lot of products. And of course it was uh, the operating system of choice at UC Berkeley, where I also worked uh, for a time uh, in, in the eighties. So the only real barrier to entry for, for BSD as a technology, uh, because it had been widely ported uh, to all sorts of different architectures, and and ninety nine percent of it, or you know, that's a made up. Number, but a large percent of it, a percentage of it, was already open source. The real barrier to entry was that it ran on expensive uh, mini computers and mainframes. So not everybody could afford a VAX. And so three eight six BSD was the first um, truly open source BSD that filled in the missing pieces that you couldn't get from the from the CSRG on their uh, CSRG net two or BSD uh, tapes and they were called tapes because they were literally tapes you'd order from uh, from Berkeley uh, and they'd send you most of BSD but not all of it not all the low core uh, stuff the, the the VM um, subsystem for a particular architecture um, you know a lot of the low level kernel pieces, for commonly av available hardware like you know 386 uh, and 486 was missing. So that's really where you know I think we have a lot to give uh, Bill Jolitz and, and his uh, his band of 386 BST hackers they're they're just due because they they broke BSD free into the PC space, which is when it really went mainstream. And so the 386 BSD uh, distribution, went for a while, it was a massive stack of floppies. And I remember, uh, I think I was one of the people hacking on the early installer that would allow you to, to copy your 386 BSD onto floppies uh, in the distribution and then walk up to a 386 or 486 and insert the first floppy boot from it. <laughs> and it would ask you, okay, floppy one of 97 done, right? Or whatever it was, it was a large number. And it would just sit there and read floppy after floppy and copy it to the disk after formatting the disk. And then finally, at the end of all that, if you didn't lose a floppy disk, yeah, you'd reboot and you'd be into BSD. You'd be into BSD on the PC. And that was that was really revelatory uh, because again, up until then, if you wanted to experience BSD as an operating system, you had to have a Sun workstation, or you had to have a VAX or a Tahoe or a Pyramid or any one of the you know sort of mini computers at the time. Uh, that ran it were hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars in some cases. So now I can run it on something that I can buy at the local store, uh, sits on my desk. And that's that's really where where we caught fire. And, and 
uh, around the same time, interestingly enough, this this guy named Linus Torvalds, uh, who is I think a research student at uh, in, in a Finnish university, had written a very simple kernel that just had two processes in it. I remember I remember it. I downloaded it and ran it, and it had two processes: A and B. And A would talk to B, and B would talk to A, and they would each print, "Hi, you know, I'm here." And that was that was where Linux was starting out. Was just a complete from scratch. Hey, let's see if I can write a kernel uh, kind of effort. Um, so, you know, props to Linux too because you know BSD had a huge head start. It just needed to be ported essentially to the x86, uh, and Linux was complete from scratch effort. Uh, I think that attracted a lot of people, you know, obviously to that effort as well because BSD was was well established. It was that you know it was your dad's operating system. It was a commercial OS that ran on you know, dozens of platforms already. But obviously, I stuck with it. And when 386 BSD kind of ran out of steam, petered out, um, we started FreeBSD. The, the last few uh, patch kit maintainers got together and said, well, we don't want this to end. And we want to continue this. And we love the centralized source model. And we love being able to build everything from source kernel to all the user land. Uh, and uh, that's when I got involved in, you know, the creating the ports collection and the packaging tools and system install was really just to, to, to not have to put everything into the core, into the base of FreeBSD, but still have a way of adding on all your, you know, your favorite shell, your favorite editor, your favorite compiler tools and so on, uh, but still in a controlled way. And honestly, FreeBSD is still one of the few operating systems out there where you can, you can build everything from a source you know, with one or two commands, that's the key thing. You know, there's wrappers for everything. The ports collection is essentially just a huge set of wrappers, 27,000, 28,000, however many there are right now. Uh, wrappers using make, not my proudest decision, but it, it works, right? And, and, uh, it, you know, and, it, and it works pretty well, actually. So, you know, that's a pr pretty amazing that it scaled out to that extent, and you can make world, as you all know, in, in your user source directory for FreeBSC itself, the core. And that's still something you can't do in another, in, uh, you know, since Minix died, <laughs> there really hasn't been another operating system where you could go and just build the entire thing with, uh, with, a, with one or two commands. So I think that's why, you know, it still thrives. And certainly it's something I tried to do again with Mac ports when I was at Apple. And create wrappers for everything and create a robust you know, collection of uh, third party sources and, and binaries and packages from, from one re repo that you could check out. Uh, and certainly other other groups like Conda and uh, 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 PIP, uh, you know, at the, the PSF, you know, have taken sort of very much the same approach. Uh, let's create a repository, let's create a single source of truth with you know, sort of different aspects of the developer to be you know, stable and so on. And uh, but but FreeBSD was one of the first to do that. So um, yeah, I think FreeBSD has, and BSD itself has always been characterized by firsts. BSD was the you know, first system to really support TCP IP, first system to have a virtual uh, memory management. Uh, you know, PDP8 wasn't wasn't didn't have a virtual memory, and the first uh, long file names, uh, fast file system. Uh, Kirk McKusick and, and uh, everyone at CSRG did a lot of pioneering work with BSD. And so it was always my hope that that, that ethos, that mindset, of uh, both having everything well organized so that you can just step into it and learn just a few simple commands and do everything with those few simple commands, see everything, have all the sources there, have all the wrappers and be taking them apart and clone them, um, and then also doing innovative things at the same time, I think those are, the, for me at least, the two core principles that, that FreeBSD was founded on. So I think that's a quick history lesson. And uh, I can turn it over to questions or we can talk about other things. OK, well, I've got a couple of questions uh, we can use to keep um, going. Um, so somebody's asked, um, I guess they were looking back at the 1.0 release time, which predates me. And they said that the first release they can see is named Epsilon, and they're curious what happened to Alpha through Delta. <laughs> wow, great question. Um, honestly, I think Alpha through, Del Alpha through Delta were so bad 
uh, that I, I don't recall there being any great appetite for ship, shipping those versions. They did exist. Um, but I think what it was, it was like one of those, you know, kind of, uh, rolling, rolling release kind of deals where it's like, okay, now we have a release candidate. Let's, oh no, that's not, that can't be it. All right. Well, we can't just reuse the same name because nobody, everybody would get confused. So let's bump, you know, let's bump a letter. Uh, so, you know, alpha, beta, uh, and so on were, were, uh, I think, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty nasty. Uh, and don't forget, even back then, we supported a lot of different ways of installing it. Uh, you could install over FTP, you could install over floppies, uh, you could install over parallel line IP, remember that, using your printer, your parallel printer port uh, from another system to send the media. Yeah, it's way faster than serial. Uh, so we were also evolving a lot of the release engineering uh, and the installation experience to try to make it accessible. Because again, if you couldn't install it fairly easily in a variety of ways, we, we were never going to get any any user community built around it. So I think Epsilon was the first one that we thought was worth actually putting on a CD. Um, and I, I do have actually every single previous D version on CD to my left. It still occupies a place on my shelf. So not that I ever unwrapped them; they're all still in the shrink wrap. So. <laughs> I have a similar, mine doesn't start until 216 or so, but I have a similar collection. Most of them shrink wrapped myself. So yeah, um, I, think I, I think I have five 1.0 CDs just because, you know, that one's significant. And I, I've had, I started with more. I used to remember I used to walk around with boxes of free CDs from yes. one Creek City Rum. And so I'd go to user groups and I would just, you know, I'd practically pit them in, pitch them into the crowd like t shirts. Uh, that was part of our early uh, arrangement with Walnut Creek CD ROM. As they could sell it, we wouldn't charge any money for our efforts. You know, they could just make money on it, but they would give the user community a certain uh, uh, umpteen thousand CDs. And occasionally I'd pack those into my luggage. I think I went to the first uh, European FreeBSD conference in Arnhem, if I remember correctly. There's a place where we all hacked our Toshiba librettos to get from 50 megahertz to 70 megahertz, you know, by soldering a couple jumper wires, because the Toshiba libretto was the preferred free BSD, you know, mini laptop of choice. Uh, but I bought, I brought boxes through the airport of CDs, and then just the same thing, and the Johnny Apple seat, just here, have a free CD. So. So you have another question. Someone asked about NetBSD um, because we know NetBSD started about the time as FreeBSD. So kind of what was your perspective on how that beginning, you know, the, kind of the divergence early on and kind of, you know, how did you see them being different at the start? Yeah, I would say that in some ways NetBSD and FreeBSD were almost like the continuation of certain factions within the CSRG. Uh, because, you know, uh, for those, those who don't know, you know, CSRG was the original, uh, I think, computer systems research group. Uh, sometimes say people say computer science research groups. I, I've heard different uh, acronymic expansions, but the CSRG at UC Berkeley was where BSD started. And there was kind of a, a, a part of it that I actually worked with in, in the early 80s who just wanted to port BSD to everything. Right, they they saw that as the way to to being ubiquitous. So they were the ones who like did the early Tahoe port. I remember, you know, there were all kinds of Tahoe tapes coming out. Most of us were saying, "What the heck is a Tahoe?" Right, it was a pretty obscure machine, uh, even for its time. Um, but it was one of the first, uh, you know, sort of non-vax versions. And of course, BSD ran on on uh, the PDP eight or PP eleven as well. Right, there was you know two dot nine, two dot X. That's like a different fork of BSD to run on a on a machine with no uh, uh, MMU. Uh, so PDP folks were running BSD, Vax folks were running BSD because of course DEC was really re really generous with their university grants back then. So pretty much if you were at university in the United States, you had some digital equipment corporation stuff around campus. So BSD ran on that stuff sort of first and foremost, and so and that group within the CSRG really wanted to run everywhere. The FreeBSD folks, you know, came from the 386 BSD ethos, which is, OMG, we finally unlocked a uh, low cost, easily accessible computing with BSD. 
And so the FreeBSD folks wanted the early, early, I think project charter was in fact, we don't want to run on everything. We just want to run really, really well on one thing. And that was x86. Now, eventually, you know, and of course, NetBSD, you know, of course it runs NetBSD with the slogans, right? At least a joke, NetBSD runs on your toaster, runs on your fridge, your microwave. Uh, and it did, supported many, many, many architectures. And FreeBSD only sort of grudgingly got into the multiple architecture game. And honestly, I think that started with the alpha, the deck alpha, because we needed a 64-bit validation platform. This was all back when you know, Intel was 32-bit only. Um, and so the alpha was going to be our proving ground. We, we all know how popular that architecture turned out to be, but, <laughs> but it, it was an important, it was an important milestone and it was the first non x86 port. So at that point, we kind of slowly opened the gates and said, oh, all right, maybe Spark, maybe, maybe PowerPC, maybe, you know, MIPS. Uh, and so I think FreeBSD still, still has kind of that that tension of saying how many architectures is enough and what defines a tier one architecture? Is it number of seats? Is it number of users? Is it the amount of money it makes somebody? I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough call. Whereas NetBSD never had to make that call really. It's like, yeah, we'll run on everything. I mean, case in point, I built an obscure PC. The PC is really the wrong word called a PC 532. And it was based on the National Semiconductor 32532 platform. And there was a bunch of us psychos, basically, that loved the National Semiconductor 32K uh, CPU architecture. I mean, I wrote assembly for it because I loved the instruction set so much. And so I wrote the bootloader for the PC 532 in assembly. And I wrote, of course, it was based on fourth, right? And I, uh, I wrote the IO subroutines and everything in assembly. And then, of course, we needed a, a Unix to run on it. And first, we ran Minix for a while because that was a fairly straightforward port. But guess which BSD was willing to run on the PC 532, of which only 150 of which I think ever existed, mine being one of them, NetBSD. NetBSD ran on the PC 532. They were that friendly to, to different architectures that they would even run on something as obscure and, and one-off as that. So that there's, there's a difference in a nutshell, right? NetBSD runs on different things just because it can, and it's fun. Which yeah, is cool. Uh, which is cool. <laughs> no, it is. Um, yeah. For reference, um, in FreeBSD, we actually removed Spark 64 two years ago and MIPS last year. So you're somewhat. Uh, you made Warner Lush cry. Actually, Warner is the one who got to remove MIPS. So. <laughs> okay. All right. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't always... think there were many tears when he did it. I, I think there was uh, more okay. relief. All right. All right. Well, yeah, man yeah. should always shoot his own dog, right? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Let's see some more questions. Someone asked if you could go back and change something about ports in a major way, what would you do differently? Yeah, I've asked myself that question several thousand times. Um, I wouldn't have used make. Uh, I mean, again, make is such a simple thing to wrap stuff in, but I mean, make is essentially just a just a wrapper around shell if you really think about it. Uh, and and. So thinking of you know tens of thousands of semi-documented shell scripts, uh, the very simple rules engine that'll run them in a certain order, um, is not the it was not the most robust architecture, um, and 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 the worst the worst thing about that choice was that there was nothing that could be really machine parsed. So you know to this day, if you want to be able to say, well, I'm going to create a special port system that's going to you know, like Poudreau, which, you know, did to, to its credit, managed to do it, but, you know, a, a much harder job to take a bunch of shell code and run it, you know, in parallel, uh, and also know sort of the security implications of every single binary you're running and every single file you're accessing and just all the runtime behavior versus saying, hey, let's build a ports collection that's all, you know, in a de descriptive data format. Um, and then just have like a very simple, you know, DSL, which does the specialized things. But hindsight is always twenty twenty, and and honestly, if I had set out to write that system, then I would have had to pick a file format, and I would have said XML, and everyone would have screamed, and 
you know, we would have had a huge fight about which metadata format to use. And then of course, the set of primitives in my little DSL would be constantly exploding because, oh, you missed this case, you missed this case. And then everybody would complain that it was too restrictive and too limiting and too hard to, to, to write a new port. Um, you know, to be clear, MacPorts, MacPorts uses Tickle. I was about so, to say Tickle. Yeah. yeah. So every, every Mac port is a program. And so it's essentially just running code. Mac, when you build something with MacPorts, you just send all the way through the hierarchy of, of needs, right? As you're building your, your big meta package or something, it's just running Tickle code. And, and I wrote a lot of the primitives in Tickle. We basically wrote raw C for walking file systems and doing operations on files and whatnot. And we, and we avoided shell to as much as we could to try to kind of create it all in raw tickle so that we could actually instrument all the entry points and exit points from the tickle code and trace it all and create you know big trace files to say okay what exactly did you do and why did you do it um but in hindsight was that really all necessary not really the the homebrew folks went and just said we're going to use ruby for all of the things and we're not going to instrument much and their recipes are very popular on the Mac. So probably you could argue that Mac ports was, was over-engineered and it used an obscure language uh, at that uh, to create all this traceability and, and sandboxing. And it, does, it even goes down to syscall tracing and stuff on the Mac to figure out exactly what the port is doing. Um, and again, it's nice for creating hermetic sandboxes, truly hermetic sandboxes and, and, and building your, the, your DAGs, right? Your build and run DAGs uh, as you execute the port and its tests and all of that stuff. But it's a lot of work. It's a huge amount of work. So maybe I wouldn't have done anything different, right? Maybe it's just enough exposed wiring that everybody can understand it easily, the, the, the FreeBSD ports collection, uh, even though you can't introspect it. And, and, and yes, the dreaded YAML programmer. Uh, so, Let's see, what else? I think Deb was asking about the history of FreeBSD and macOS. So that's, a, that's another popular question. Um, when I joined Apple in 2001, uh, they had kind of almost finished the whole Darwin next step uh, macOS 9 collision, because it really sort of was. I mean, a bunch of things came out of the old macOS 9 code base, like a open directory and you know, so the authentication system uh, the ability to speak Apple Talk, the ability to uh, use the HFS, right? Uh, a lot of stuff came from the legacy Apple code base. And obviously even more stuff came from Next Step, which is the company that Apple acquired. So in 2001, I would really have said that Mac OS was a combination of Next Step and uh, Mac OS 9 or some of the code for Mac OS 9 and like an early, early sync up with, I think the FreeBSD 4 dot something, 3 dot something user land, because they were, there was a lot of stuff in next step that was pretty antiquated, right? I mean, next step was another early BSD fork. I think it was created around the 4.2 timeframe, but don't quote me on that. Wikipedia will have a better, better answer than my brain. Um, so next step was an early BSD fork. So some folks at Apple before I got there had already done like a quick refresh and they'd grab some stuff from NextBSD, they'd grab some stuff from FreeBSD, they'd grab some, some stuff from the, the attic from all I could tell. Like we had man pages that like declared themselves to be, you know, Ultrix and stuff like that. So it was like, where did this come from? Uh, so 2001 to 2003 or so I would say was spent in just cleaning up. And because I came directly out of the FreeBSD project, of course, I synchronized as much of the user land as possible uh, to FreeBSD, if only so that I had a unified source of provenance, right? It's like the vendor branch, right? You wanna have one vendor branch so that you, know, you can see all of your changes and uh, clearly. So I, I kind of cleaned up the Mac OS vendor branch, so to speak, that came from FreeBSD. But the kernel has always been completely different, right? The kernel of Mac OS is called XMU, which is acronym for X and use not Unix. It's it's based on on mock. And you know, this is this is early uh, a bunch of mock folks from Carnegie Mellon came along with with next step. 
So they had their own ideas about kernel design. And actually a funny throwback there, before 386 VSD, there was actually another VSD that ran on the x86, but it was even harder to get a hold of, and it was called LITES, all capitals, L-I-T-E-S. And that was Mach 3.0 running as a true microkernel and a BSD single server running as a process, essentially. So all of BSD was a personality running outside of Mach. And I actually ran that and was part of the team that got exported to it and everything. So we, we actually had x86 workstations based on lights. I remember working with Johannes Hollander in the early days on that. So even before 386 BSD, I was working on that. So of course, when I went to Apple, I came back and was like, oh, my old friend Mach. Uh, uh, but all they've done is taken Mach 3.0 and, and uh, linked it into the same address space. So they're not running the genuine single server model that Mach was originally designed to support, which by the way, GNU Herd also supports, uh, you know, the true out of process kernel, so to speak. Uh, and so, but, it, but the reason why it was merged and, and you know, homogenous kernel uh, was created was just performance, right? All that messaging was was a real overhead. And, and we could definitely see it on the early 386s that I was using when I was doing lights development. Um, it was just slow. It worked though, right? But it was slow. So Mac OS is a, the XNU kernel, which is its own special beast. IO kit for drivers, all kinds of special stuff in there. Very, very mock based, still using mock IPC uh, and and uh, mock ports and uh, some BSD stuff. So I think the net code was was cloned out of some version of BSD. Uh, so TCP/IP is, but again, Apple hacks on everything, right? And they hack on, hack on everything because they have to, not necessarily because they want to, right? Running, make porting Mac OS to iOS or creating iOS out of Mac OS was a huge engineering challenge and required massive changes to, to you know, how memory was handled and a lot of you know, power performance. Uh, so FreeBSD is a component. It's a component, but it's not Mac OS. Very clearly not. Right? Different, different kernel, different device driver model, different, different user land, but borrowing from FreeBSD and other sources. But we at least homogenize the BSDs in there. So it is, it is mostly FreeBSD for the parts that are open source BSD, and you can still grow, grab all that stuff from opensource.apple.com. So that stuff's uh, visible. You can, you can go check it out for yourself. Hopefully, that answers that question. Yep, I think so. Um, so one question I had for you is um, maybe did you want to talk a little bit about uh, CDROM.com and getting involved with Walnut Creek and um, FTP.CDROM.com, which in its day was a big deal. It was, it was. Yeah, so, so you know, picture me, I'm living in, in my house in, or my apartment, I should say. I, I went to a, a house there for, for a few years. Um, uh, in Dublin, Ireland, working for Lotus, uh, porting notes and Word and one, two, three uh, to, I think it was 17 different versions of Unix. So, so Lotus, Lotus put their Unix development uh, um, group, I think that's what we were called, um, in Ireland, as I always said, to prevent the, a, the Windows and OS2 antibodies in Boston from killing them. Uh, because, you know, 99% of Lotus was, was Windows and OS2, right? The early note servers were OS2 servers. They actually ran quite well. OS2 was a decent operating system. It was, you know, it was pretty, pretty, pretty solid. So if you ran Lotus notes, um, you had a note server running on OS, a cluster of OS2 machines, and then you ran your Lotus Notes client and it was you know, sort of a fancy distributed database with a little language that would let you kind of write your own uh, UIs on top of it. So we, we Lotus sold a lot of uh, stuff to, to big companies like GM, for example. And every once in a while, like with GM, they would say, we'll buy X number of thousand Lotus Notes seats if you also run on SCO. 
or if you also run on interactive Unix, or you run on HQX, or you run on SARS, or you run on uh, AIX. And so we became sort of the dumping ground for every possible Unix distribution you can imagine that anybody would buy a copy of a Lotus product for. So I'm incredibly frustrated at work every day trying to get our stuff to port to 17 different Linux, uh, Unix flavors. This is all pre-Linux. And then I come home and I work on a nice operating system, which was, you know, at the time of lights and then 386 BSD. And so I had a lot of computers at my house and a bunch of them were Amigas because I'm also an Amiga fan. I actually have an Amiga 500 uh, recreation. Just I just ordered uh, to run some little software on. And, and I went to my shelf thinking about how to get FreeBSD more out there. And I looked at all of my CDs. I had a huge, this is, CD was a huge way of distributing software because the internet was slow, right? And not everybody had a, even a 14, 4K modem. So I looked for the CDs with the highest production values I could find. And I pulled out the AmiNet CD, which was the Amiga network CD. And it had really nice artwork on it. And so I just opened it up, looked at it, and I flipped it over and I said, who made this? And I saw a little company named All Creek CD-ROM in California. And there was a phone number on it. And I called the phone number and a guy named Jack answered. And I, I know I know John's smiling now because he knew Jack. Uh, God rest his soul. He's no longer with us. But but Jack was the kind of guy who was just crazy enough to take a, a phone call at two o'clock in the morning. I didn't I didn't quite calculate the time difference. So it ends up ends up by calling Wanna Creek CD ROM like it was after midnight sometime. And Jack answers immediately, hello. And I'm like, oh hi, I'm some random dude you've never heard of in Dublin, Ireland who had just did a FreeBSD 1.0 Epsilon release. And it's a Unix operating system for the PC. And I would love to put it on CD. What do you think? Would you be willing to publish it for us? And he said, sure. <laughs> and honestly, the rest is history. Um, and in fact, in sort of one of the greatest, most spectacular corporate misses of all time, we decided that we would create an FTP site and run FreeBSD on it. David Greenman went and, you know, I think, you know, built the hardware, designed it with as many, you know, SCSI controllers as you could fit. And, you know, FTPCROM.com multiple evolutions. So, you know, I'm probably describing one somewhere in the middle. But uh, we, we, we ran it on the T1 line in the corporate office. And, and by the way, we did a couple of releases with Walnut Creek CD-ROM and it actually started to sell pretty well. And they gave us those, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of CDs to hand out at conferences. And so word of mouth spread. And so it started to establish a pretty decent user base. So FTPCD-ROM.com kind of kind of also grows in popular. It was also the place to FTP uh, Sintel, and a bunch of non-FreeBSD stuff. So I don't want to make it sound like FreeBSD was the number one downloader there. And there was quite a few collections of stuff for Windows and OS2 and scientific and uh, you know, pictures, right? We remember had all those different picture CD-ROMs that had all the different catalogs, you know, the pictures that were free. So a lot of uh, photographic, uh, you know, uh, enthusiasts were downloading these collections. And it was all running on a single T1 line what, 1.54 megabits per second? Uh, and uh, and it overloaded. It's, but there came a point, uh, I, at some point I had moved back to the United States because it said, uh, yeah, you know, Dublin's great, but and Ireland's great. I lived in Galway too. So I you know, lived in a couple parts of Ireland, and, but I just like, I wanted to go back to Silicon Valley where I came from. So Walnut Creek City Ram General Games said, come back and work for us. And we couldn't work anymore because the T1 line was getting saturated. And so, and so, uh, we just looked at the latency. It was just terrible. It was like, oh, what's seeing in the network, the internet? Oh, an FTP site. So we moved it to to a colo. And I remember, you know, how proud David was. You know, we got our first rack in a colo, and he built FTPCROM.com there. And now we had all this transit, and then it just exploded, and it became the busiest FTP site on the internet. And we broke records. What was it when we, when we broke like a terabyte a day or something? Everyone was jumping up and down like, oh my God, a whole terabyte, uh, you know, which was a lot 
uh, for the day. And, and the miss was that we, we, we missed the internet, right? We were a CD-ROM publisher. So we just kept working on publishing CD-ROMs and nobody ever stopped to think, you know, I bet people would pay to, to put this on a, on a site somewhere and have somebody else run it for them, right? We could have created the, the first CDN uh, you know, a network of, of FreeBSD machines and all the strategic colos and just kept adding storage and, and renting that storage out to other people. I think I had a conversation with Bob early on about, you know, something like that. I can't claim that I had that idea exactly. And he was like, nah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, missed opportunities. But, but yes, for a time we were, we were, we were kings of the internet with FreeBSD. So Peter Wem, who you know, had a question. I guess he says at one point, Water Creek moved the Water Creek office for Water Creek CRM moved to a chicken farm. I'm not aware of <laughs> what that is. Maybe you could provide some background. Uh, I was well, so I don't remember that, but I do remember the chicken farm coming to Walnut Creek CD ROM. Uh, so, so Bob Bruce, who was our CEO uh, through all of the Walnut Creek CD-ROM uh, era, right? There was multiple chapters in that in that story, uh, mergers and acquisitions and things that happened subsequently, right? But but for the first part, Bob was was the, the proprietor, and you know, Bob kind of you know set the culture. Uh, Bob would sleep on a board in a pallet rack. And when I mean a board, I mean like literally a piece of plywood. And we would go and say, Bob, don't you want a mattress? No, it's bad for you. Uh, it, but Bob was an ex-Marine. So he spent a lot, he probably spent too much time in the Marines. And so he had a certain, you know, standard of comfort, which was basically you lay on the ground, it's fine. And so he um, he had a house nearby and he started raising chickens at the house. Uh, interestingly enough, I lived in that house for a little bit of time because when I came over from Ireland, I had nowhere to live yet. And you know, Bob said, hey, I got this empty house. Come stay in it. So I lived with the chickens, too, over there uh, and, and the pool that had turned into a biological experiment and a couple other interesting attributes. But, hey, you know, it was a place to crash. It was fine. Uh, younger days. And the chickens went through several generations. And eventually we decided that for safety reasons, the baby chicks should come to the office. So there was a room at the office at Wanna Creek Ron that was the chicken room. And lots of baby chicks lived in there because they were safe from raccoons and stuff. And then occasionally somebody would open the door of the chicken room and the chickens would escape. And so you'd have chickens running around the office and nobody thought anything of it because, you know, it's totally normal. Did I mention Wanna Creek City Ron was an interesting place? Yes, it is. I was only there for a few years, but it was, I remember, I'll share because I shared on IRC, when I came out to interview, and interview is an interesting word for my first week at one of the great CD-ROM um, during my senior year, uh, I stayed with Bob, so I, I got the full Bob treatment. Um, yes, it's, it was an experience, that's for certain. Yes, yes. So Bob is, Bob is, is alive and well, living in Hawaii, so, so yeah. Um, yeah, anyway. That's that's the that's the Water Creek CD ROM story. And trust me, it goes on and on. Interestingly, though, I'll just point out I met my wife there. So oh, yes, that's right. Yes. 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 I was I was the CTO and she was the CFO slash COO. And uh, we were we got married and we've been together ever since. So she's downstairs doing something as we speak. So one question we had um, from someone is, can you share your opinion on Grand Central Dispatch and what if FreeBSD can or should take from it? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so GCD is is definitely one of the things I'm I'm one of the things I'm proudest of in Mac OS because it kind of you know, came out it came out of the BSD group. So the BSD group was something that Apple created kind of for me, right? They just named it the BSD group and say, there you go, go and be in charge of the BSD parts of, of Mac OS and, and later iOS and, and tvOS and all that stuff. So, um, so the BSD group was actually pretty innovative, you know, if I don't say so myself. Um, and so we, we wanted to create a run loop 
for Mac OS. That was really where it started was we need a run loop so that we can deal with asynchronous events. So the reason I, I point that out is I think FreeBSD does in its user land or in its runtime have to be able to deal increasingly with asynchrony, right? In, in, in Linux, you already have Dbus, for example, which is one of the you know, fundamental plumbing uh, mechanisms and a lot of processes are consuming events dynamically uh, and doing things and generating their own events. And that's how the whole operating system stack works. Uh, but it's kind of a pain in the butt to program just to a raw run loop. So GCD took that early run loop idea and then we said, all right, well, we have we need to be able to, to put stuff into different parts of the run loop because we also had multiple run loops, right? We had to go run another run loop and then come back from that and then go into GCD because we, we weren't the first run loop or CF run loop, I think was the first one. Um, and so in order to unify all those different run loops, we had to create a flexible dispatching model. And it was uh, uh, Dave Z's uh, very uh, smart idea, I thought, to say, let's take the queue, the fundamental you know, uh, notion. So everything will just be a queue. And of course, you can nest queues. You can have queues that contain queues or queues that contain terminal objects to go execute. And because you can run things in the queue uh, in a fairly straightforward way, now you can have synchronous and asynchronous queues. So now you can sort of schedule things against a queue with either sync or an async property. And uh, you can also synchronize in an asynchronous queue, which just says just block here until everything prior to you in the queue runs and then your thing will run. And so that and the nesting and the ability to flexibly have threads run these queues. And you know you can start even with just one thread and every queue is just a continuation. Just you know at the very end of the queue, it just looks for another queue to jump into. And so it's pure tail call sort of you know continuation uh, programming. But if you start getting genuinely concur concurrent, if things start to block, you can automatically respond more threads. So I'll answer the question by saying thread handling is one of the biggest bugaboos in operating systems. And it's not going away because you've got all these cores and you, if you, you know, do what I actually did, which is go to NVIDIA uh, or to, or you work in the GPU space, you look in the GPUs and you go, oh my God, it's full of cores, right? It's just, <laughs> it's more cores here than I've ever seen. And so, so that you have to kind of start organizing them as groups and, you know, have warps and, but there's, there is like a huge multi-threading problem in the GPU space, a growing multi-threading problem in the CPU space because we're still growing laterally now, right? Moore's law is, is over, by the way. I think we hit the ceiling uh, this year or we will next year. And then that's basically just keep going parallel uh, or keep distributing the computation. Oh, shove it into a DPU or shove it into a GPU, shove it into another CPU running another host with uh, Rocky or you know something for really high speed transport and do distributed shared memory and right when you get into hpc all that stuff is just the bread and butter and and it's all clusters of machines so should freebsd uh, adopt grand central dispatch i'd say at this point the low level CAPIs for it are nice but i wouldn't use them directly i would i would wrap something else around gcd I, I mean, I'd still support the C APIs just because they're, they're convenient, they're easy to use, right? And then you can sprinkle them through your code and make it multi-threaded without ever having to think about threading at all, right? There's no explicit threads in Grand Central Dispatch. You don't think about threads, you think about queues. So we ported, I mean, Robert Watson did a GCD port to, to CSD, uh, I think I paid him to do that. Uh, when I was at Apple, uh, I wanted another port uh, of GCD as a reference, um, but, but that or some higher level semantics, if you look at how Swift uses GCD, for example, it's it's really it's really implicit, right? If you look at Go and the Go routines and stuff, right? There are higher level models and metaphors to consume now. And then you can use something like GCD under the covers. I'm just cognizant that, you know, it's like 15 years after GCD was invented or whatever it was, right? But, you know, things have gotten more and more, more abstract since then. But, uh, but fundamentally, you need a solution. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so I, have, I would have what I think I can, if I remember it correctly, I can ask you about. I remember reading 
a little bit about a story uh, or maybe something posted on Usenet that at some point you had used wall to send a message and it went oh, come on. Than, you, <laughs> than you expected. Man, let, 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 me, let, let, let me move past that finally. Uh, yeah, yeah, no. it, it's on my Wikipedia page. Uh, you can read the gory details there. I don't know who put that story there, by the way, but it is true. Uh, I did our wall the internet. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, what, what, I think, what, what I think was actually more 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 funny than our wall the internet. Well, it wasn't funny at the time. It was a mistake. So again, look look it up on Wikipedia. It's all documented there. But um, is the fact that I think two years. There was a fictitious Olympics called the the Usenet Spam Olympics. Uh, it was written by some 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 wit on Usenet, and and he he nominated me, uh, or he, he gave me a prize in the Spam Olympics as the first spammer, because I had put this this text on on you know tens of thousands of screens uh, all over the world, um, and you know obviously I wasn't selling uh, hair extensions or anything i was just saying hi <laughs> so it was, if it was spam it wasn't very commercially successful spam but but i i was i was greatly amused by that it's like yeah okay well, it's the, it's a fair cop i guess i am the first spammer the first person to annoy people internet wide but not the last so barely related you may find it interesting You've had several bug reports recently um, from Robert Morris um, finding like all sorts of exploits and things um, in FreeBSD, like like really interesting bugs. But yeah, yeah. When, when going back to early his, days, when he did his original uh, uh, original worm, uh, I remember we called him RTFM for Robert T. Morris. <laughs> <laughs> Because he caused a lot of trouble, a lot of systems got shut down. Yeah, and I, I think it used the finger D hole as like one of its primary propagation mechanisms. So there, there were, I mean, speaking of our wall, there were a lot of services running on the internet back then that had no access controls, and that was essentially what I found was that you know our walling a little message to the to the broadcast group would end up running through every single entry in anti uh, host.txt. Because remember the internet and that they had every host in your host.txt file. Um, and, and just to say, hey, hi, here's a message for you. And if you're running X, it'll go into the frame buffer and just, just write all over your screen, which is what I did to the inspector general of the Arbanet, Dennis Perry. So um, yeah, yeah, I got a lot of attention for that. So another question, uh, well, I have a couple of different questions here. Um, so somebody asked, uh, do you have any thoughts about the kind of generic, let's see if, I'll read the question, you can ask, see how you want to answer it. The generic sound kind of driver from, that went from Linux into FreeBSD, um, this person says in October of 93, it is still in the tree as PCM. Although my memory is that Cameron Grant, like, Pretty much rewrote PCM. Yeah, that's quite the Linux driver anymore. No, no, no. So I mean, I'm going to correct that. Um, well, so there were there were two audio drivers. So remember, remember Dev Speaker, which was a PCM driver for the speaker in your PC. Um, which, by the way, only goes on and only goes off. <laughs> Oh, you but, missed you missed a bite shed from hell about how we didn't have the frequency right, or like we had this long-standing bug, and that's why the the, the key beep was, was annoying, and so we could still leave it on if we fixed it to actually do the frequency. Yeah, this is like in the last awesome. year. Oh, that sounds like the best bike shed ever. Yeah. So, so that speaker was really the first audio driver in FreeBSD, and I and I bring it up for two reasons. One, to give credit where credit is due, because that speaker did work, and you could actually see him. Uh, tones to it you could play music through it you know pcm music uh it sounded horrible but but you could do it and second reason is dev speaker the source code for it if you find it is some of the most brilliant code i have ever read i'm just going to say it right here in the public dev speakers implementation blew my mind whoever whoever wrote that i don't remember that uh, uh, their name uh was an unsung genius Cameron Grant is another unsung genius 
who wrote who wrote the the real audio code and uh, support for the Sound Blaster and all the early uh, you know uh, audio cards. And what a lot of people don't remember or know about Cameron is that he was completely paralyzed. He had the same uh, uh, neurogenerative disease that Stephen Hawk Hawking had. So I went to visit him in the UK and uh, my wife and I uh, went to meet him and his caregiver. And he was very happy to see us. He was in some really obscure part of the UK. I remember we had to take like two buses and a train and right, it was you know a, a, a lot of work to get out into these, you know, this highly suburban environment he was in. But I remember meeting him and just thinking he was one of the finest, most amazing humans I had ever met because he had typed out, well, one, he was just a really nice guy. He was just really, really fun to talk to. And, and, and you know, his personality came through online. But he typed that entire driver using a straw in his mouth, typing on the keyboard with his, with his mouth. So when I saw that, I was just like, okay. <laughs> you know, I can't, I can't even imagine how you did that. So yeah, Cameron, one of FreeBSD's early heroes. Another uh, sadly passed away eventually from his illness, but uh, but he wrote some great code and under the most challenging circumstances possible. So I would say the audio code has, <laughs> has a wonderful li lineage uh, of you know brilliance and perseverance in FreeBSD, but it doesn't come from Linux. Okay, um, I will not repost people giving things to your things you already answered. Your people found the link to your spam award, I think. Post Wait, what? Over IRC. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's yeah, the exact message. You know, this, this is a test of area coverage or something. Uh, reaching everybody in Berkeley. I really <laughs> turned out it went wider than that. Somebody had a question back to ftp.cdrom.com asking what FTP daemon was used that can handle that load. Oh, wow, that's a great question. We started originally with it with the stock TPD, but I think David Green back on it. Um, somebody did. So I remember, you know, the one that so the FTPD that set the records was not stock FTPD. Um, but now, now you've left me really wondering because it's, it's sort of one of those implementation details. I just remember it's like, oh yeah, we're gonna have to do this, we're gonna have to do this. And but weren't 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 socket uh, or accept filters? Not done? accept filters, but sin file, I think, was David and yes. he did sin file for his FTBT. And that was a big part of getting to the to the performance he got. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, so so that was you know, that is a great example of you know, uh, uh, form uh, following function, right? It was, it, was, it was like, okay, what do we need to do to make FreeBSD be the very best uh, FTP server in the world? And yeah, that's right, sin file. Boy, I, that's a blast from the past. I thought about that for a long time. Um, I think KQs might have also been used at some point to get to, to be able to, to do the multiple dispatching. Because uh, because our FTPD was very good at, at running multiple requests, but you had to throttle right because at some point you overwhelmed the SCSI bus and now you're just you're you know you're contending with yourself. So a lot of that that stuff was tuned by hand based on feedback and, and telemetry and you know, statistics coming from the server. So yeah, in fact, I think uh, David Greenman subsequently uh, turned all of that FTP expertise into Download.com. Uh, David was was behind that, so he he did he he got the message that the internet was a big deal, uh, and <laughs> took took his experience and created that uh, that service. Okay, let's see. Um, I have an older question from a while ago, which was when you were talking about Alpha, did you have a like a general impression of the Alpha architecture compared to other architectures you had worked with? Um, well, you know, I mentioned earlier that I was a big fan of the National Semiconductor Architecture just because it was so VAX-like. Um, of course, that, that architecture failed. But there's too many bugs in the CPU, essentially. Um, the Alpha, 
I tried hard to like it. I really did. Uh, I mean, it 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 definitely was a was a CPU that did some serious flexing for its time, right? And again, it was the first sixty four bit, you know, sort of even remotely commodity priced CPU. So I think it deserves you know a lot of kudos for being first. Um, and it was certainly nowhere near as bad as you know some of the the, the hacks that the x86 was doing as it was evolving and growing and you know trying to you know, continue to get performance out of what was an 8086 on increasing amounts of steroids so if you're comparing it i would say the alpha was pretty clean uh but but it wasn't as clean as some of the other cpu architectures i, I like the 88k for example i thought that was that was a decent architecture uh, so i'm kind of an architecture snob Any other questions? I've asked on IRC, we're also at an hour. I don't know how much that, I think that's about how much of your time I asked for too. So I don't want to take up too much time. Yeah, I mean, I can I can go the full remaining three minutes, uh, but yes, I do need to, uh, oh, here's a question. Did I make sure to back up my FreeBSD releases to the internet archival for long-term archival? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I didn't do anything explicitly. I, you know, we just released the bits. Uh, no, I don't think anybody at the time was really thinking of posterity. You know, I mean, I'd have kept my old 67 Mustang fastback if I knew that a you know, car might be worth restoring someday. But at the time, it was like, ah, this thing doesn't run very well. So, so no, I, I haven't done it, but I'm sure someone has. Um, it looks like uh, it looks like Des has a comment, a question about ARM. Um, I like the ARM architecture. Um, yeah, I mean, we had a little trouble buying it, but other than that, uh, I think it's it's a it's a solid architecture. And and uh, I mean, I have a lot of experience with it since Apple obviously invested in it, in it so highly. Um, in fact, interestingly enough, I. I had an Acorn A5 machine when I lived in Ireland, which was also based on, on you know, the Archimedes ARM processor, which was the early, you know, early days ARM. So I've actually been a fan of the of the processor architecture for a while. Um, it's going to be interesting to see you know how it how it goes uh, in the server market. Um, so obviously, I think that I think it's time for that. You know that to be tried again. We've had some folks who, who tried to make uh, ARM server plays before um, with you know less and more success, but I think I think uh, time is right to, to to push that again. So and obviously you know NVIDIA is, is a big part of that. So so yeah, I like ARM. I like ARM and I think I think it's gonna be I think it's I think it's a huge success, obviously, right? I mean it's you know it's everywhere. In fact I'm going to I'm going to take that opportunity to, to give a mini rant, which is I would love FreeBSD, love 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 FreeBSD to run every single Raspberry Pi part as one of the default images, because the thing that people really uh, kind of miss uh, when they think about ARM is it's not just all up here or all on your you know your fancy phone or your iPad or whatever, which is really pretty you know serious heavy duty ARM CPU parts. Uh, and obviously, you know, video's grace is going to be, you know, even, even more impressive, but down at the low end too, is where you get parts uh, until the chip shortage kind of screwed up the pricing for a while, uh, where you can get, get a whole PC for under 50 bucks. And, you know, it's one of my personal passions to see computing spread, uh, in underdeveloped nations, right? And I, so I, I basically would love anybody to be able to have a workable, Unix system for fifty dollars or less, right? and then including the price of the SD card, and you know, go scrounge a keyboard and a mouse from from you know from the recycling uh, place somewhere, and then an old screen that you know nobody else wants anymore, and boom, you know, for not so much money, you've got a full desktop. So I've got a ton of Raspberry Pis on my desk. You can't see my IoT desk from here. My little whole desk full of IoT devices, including all the stuff that NVIDIA makes, right? And um, and it's it's awesome stuff because it's just increasing power so much 
with every generation. The Raspberry Pi 4 is is a great little machine. It's it's great. I mean, you know, I use a full-blown Mac workstation, so I'm not going to use it as my personal workstation, but I run all my my 3D printers off of uh, Raspberry Pis. I have uh, the front end pretty much every automation task I have at my house. So I want to run FreeBSD on those things. And I want to be able to get the OS image straight from the RAS, you know, Raspberry Pi website. So I put that challenge out to the FreeBSD community if you want to run on something that every single person on the planet can afford. That would be great. What's FreeBSD missing on the Raspberry Pi? A full desktop with, with you know, Minecraft and a few cool, you know, and Python and everything. Look at Raspbian. The Raspberry Pi OS for Linux is awesome. It's truly awesome because it's it's a batteries included, everything you need to be instantly productive environment. It's got all the GPIO libraries installed, the I2C and Spy. Everything is set up to just be an out-of-box experience that you just go boom. And so that's that's the that's the key part, right? It's just aggregating all the stuff together and having a nice little desktop distribution for the Pi. And it, and it has to be a desktop distribution because that's where people are going to start, right? Then you you can have a lightweight version if you run know, a headless and you're like, well, I want to run a lot of my, my own pies. But and that's the truth, right? First, you have to hit the goal of you know the full batteries included version, and then be able to to customize it and subtract stuff out. In my personal opinion. So one more question from IRC. Um, mm -hmm. So I know I guess you worked in genomics for a while, or gen I'll, I'll probably butcher that. Did you have the opportunity to uh, use FreeBSD in any way in that space? I guess someone's no. asking, is there a chance FreeBSD is running in a se sequencer somewhere? Nope, all Linux. And the reason being that, you know, when you go to uh, their site or any of the big SOM vendors, you know, system on module, which you're going to put into a portable, you know, or agnostics device, it, all the drivers, all the, all the boot code, you know, all the device support, is Linux, Linux, Linux. And that's that's not really even so much the, the fault of the FreeBSD community, it's the vendors, right? Calling, calling you know, in these uh, various companies in Israel who produce SOMAs, for example, say, hey, can you support FreeBSD click, right? Is, is kind of a, you know, difficult a chicken and egg scenario, right? I mean, they would totally answer your phone call if you represented somebody with, you know, some number of zeros on the check, uh, then that's a different conversation. But, um, you know, getting FreeBSD into the into the embedded world uh, requires a lot of low level, you know, stuff. And and ironically, one of FreeBSD's early contributors is is a uh, uh, Jakob Klama, and his his company in Warsaw does a ton of that kind of stuff. But it's it's mostly Linux because that's what their their customers are asking for. But you know, he's got the know how to do it. <laughs> Somebody, somebody wanted uh, you know to, to to put it on something. So so yeah, for my for my biomedical stuff, uh, I just lived in, in Linux all the time. In fact, Jakob uh, worked for me for a while and did a custom Linux distro that was perfectly tailored to the psalms that we were shipping. You know, nothing more, nothing less than what you need. And uh, so if FreeBSD can figure out how to crack that and create those customized, you know, tailor made uh, distributions. Um, that'd be that'd be cool. That would also, you know, take care of the Raspberry Pis and the, the other competitors who I think are going to increasingly try and challenge Raspberry for for you know that sort of twenty dollar computer space. Um, and again, don't diss the twenty dollar computer. I mean, you look at the like the Pi Zero Two and some of the later generations; they're they're capable too. They have they have a full on you know. Uh, decent memory footprint they got wi-fi they got bluetooth they got all the radios you need uh to just just be an internet appliance i ran i run home assistant and a bunch of things on, on raspberry Pis, and they're, they're just great so yeah i would love to have had freebsd on the song is the answer to that question it just was too hard okay um well, I guess I have one more question that I have, and then I can let you go if you, especially if we're, we're already a few minutes past, so I don't know what your yeah. schedule is like. Let, um, let me look real quick. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, actually, I don't have a hard stop, shockingly, so I can go a bit over. 
Okay, well, the, one more question that somebody asked. He's actually one of your coworkers because he also works at NVIDIA in a different part. Mm -hmm. um, he asked about, are, do you have any thoughts about network performance on multiprocessor systems, in particular, um, more recent synchronization methods like uh, AppBuck and FreeBSD or SMR, which are similar to Linux's read, copy, update. So kind of safe memory rec reclamation schemes. Yeah, I mean, well, boy, that's a complicated topic. <laughs> I don't know if we have enough time for that, but but you know, the, the RCU implementation is a, is a great example uh, of something that yes, it's and it's a linchpin of of a lot of uh, different subsystems. And you know, you can get you know with, uh, a IRCU, I think it's called, uh, to do a lot of this in user land, uh, but. But I think the, the more fundamental question, particularly since um, Mellanox, I think, still supports FreeBSD as a as a you know a good citizen and and has a lot of uh, driver support, is how are clusters of FreeBSD machines going to talk to each other at high speed, right? And you know, low latency, high throughput, talking you know 400 gigabit per second interfaces, and you're talking multiple 400 gigabit per second interfaces. So that's the kind of that's the world in which I live every day uh, because I work for NVIDIA. Uh, so you have to do computational offload <laughs> at those sorts of aggregate data rates, right? If you're if you're dealing with you know terabits per second in the aggregate, are you going to do if you're going to have your CPU do all the crypto? Uh, you know, compression, decompression, because you want to get more than terabits per second, or you know, whatever, whatever line rate types of computation you want to do, that's a very fertile area for OS research. And and that is absolutely where, where things are heading, right? It's no longer about your machine. It's about a cluster of machines. Um, and yes, certainly cloud will continue to have its role and you'll have stuff that's you know far enough away that you're not gonna think, be thinking about things like Rocky or you know, InfiniBand or, or, or NVLink or any of the really high speed uh, uh, transport uh, methods. But even talking into the cloud can, can, can uh, involve some pretty high data rates depending on you know, the speed of your transit. And then within the cloud that you may build or rent or lease or whatever, you're gonna have, again, as you're building these large, uh, you know, partition global address space applications, whatever, particularly for AI, right? You're going to have some 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 serious data on your hands, so I'm not sure what the exact question was, but I'm going to read that as: Is it important for FreeBSD to be cognizant of high speed networking? The answer is yes, absolutely, because that's the bottleneck, right? Where there's multiple bottlenecks, but if you're going to put more compute power into a node, how do you get data to it quickly enough that? the watts that it's burning are being constructively burned, right? That you're, you're just crunching through as much data as you can, particularly when you're doing training. Uh, and the answer is, mm, that's a hard problem. You have to optimize a lot of different uh, pieces of the problem to get the CPUs and GPUs fed at the appropriate data rates, because you're dealing with enormous, enormous training data sets now, just getting the data into the, the code that's training. And of course, you get that because oh, half a billion parameter model. And I put that on the same mm, Maybe, <laughs> right? It's going to start to run out of headroom, though. I'd rather put it on four machines and, and chuck it up. Uh, the parallelism between the nodes and, and how they're talking to each other. So RDMA, right? Basically, that's, you know, that's the kernel challenge. How do I do RDMA to storage? How do we do RDMA to other nodes? Uh, RDMA you know, from the network controller to bring stuff in and out of the network fabric. If you're not doing RDMA, you're doing it wrong. Kind of, you know, I'm being dramatic to make a point, but it's, you know, seriously, I mean, at those data rates, you have no other choice. Well, I keep saying one more question, but this time I mean it, because it okay. there's a fun question in the chat here on Zoom from Deb at the foundation. She's asking, how many pets do you have? And I, I did a call. At some point, there was like a cat counter on your web page when I first met you, like in, back in '99 or 2000 or so. Yeah, that went out of date really quickly. Uh, so, so yes, I am now. I'm currently down to ten cats and five dogs, 
uh, and not that I'm saying down to. Uh, my wife was a volunteer at a pet shelter for a while, uh, and that uh, that meant that we got all the broken ones. Um, but they're all awesome. You know, I've got a one-eyed cat just running around right now. Uh, she saw her briefly in the in the Zoom. Um, and uh, so, yeah, uh, 10 cats, five dogs, and I think 24 koi. And that's currently it. We're actually on the downward slope right now. We're, we're trying not to, try not to get any more. Just focus on quality of life and the number that we have. Okay. We've had, we've had easily twice as many different times. But, but you know, when you ask the next question, well, how do you handle that? Well, we have a cattery. It's all been built out to, to house the cats, and they're all indoor only, and they don't go outside and get eaten by wildlife. We live in the mountains, so we have a lot of land around us. The dogs can run around, not annoy anybody. So you got to have the, you know, I wouldn't do this in an apartment for sure. Well, thank you very much for spending time with us today and talking about all sorts of things. Um, and some my pleasure. early history stuff. So we really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Okay. Thanks, George. Thanks later, folks. Cheers. Okay. Bye. And for folks um, coming to the summit, thank you for coming to our first day. Uh, we will start again tomorrow at about the same time. I mean, tomorrow, depending on your time zone. I know some of you folks are already in tomorrow in your time zone. Um, but uh, several hours from now, we'll start up again for day two, uh, Friday, and we'll see you then. Thank you for coming to our day, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye, all.